Great. Hello, everybody. My name is Mark Verdell. I'm uh, from Georgia Tech, and I'm going to talk to you about why I think artificial intelligence computers in general should be able to read and write stories. And I'm coming from this from a particular perspective, which is that um, storytelling is a fundamental thing that we as humans do, it's a fundamental part of the human experience. We tell stories all the time. We probably all have stories, hopefully blessedly boring, about how we got here to this particular conference. We'll have stories to tell when we get back to our family and our friends when we get back home. We watch movies, we read books, we play computer games. All these are ways in which stories come into our lives and how we use those to communicate, understand the world, and explain, communicate with each other. So some psychologists will even go so far to say that humans have what's called narrative intelligence, this ability to craft, tell, understand, and effectively respond to stories that is somehow a um, special privileged type of um, reasoning that separates us from other forms of intelligences. And my research at Georgia Tech has been trying to instill computers with narrative intelligence. And so I'll give you, um, I'll talk about a few things uh, very briefly, but what I want to start with is telling you why I think we should actually build computational narrative intelligences, what sorts of problems do I think we can actually address, what challenges should we be able to meet if we could do that. Then I'll give you two little teasers about some of the projects that I've been working on in these particular areas. So the, some of the challenges, some of the things that I think we could do, um, one is story understanding. Story understanding has been a problem in artificial intelligence for uh, practically as long as artificial intelligence has been around. So if I give um, a human a story like this in the green, when you read that, um, you'd probably say you could understand it. How do I know you understand it? I can ask you questions about it. I can ask you, did John eat food? Did Sally and John arrive together? Most of you would probably agree that John ate food and John and Sally did in fact arrive together. None of which is actually conveyed in the story itself. And the reason why you're able to answer those questions is because it's not just what's in the story, but it's the fact that we all kind of share these common mental models about what it means to go to restaurants, what it means to kind of exist in this world, to live in this world, and act, interact with each other. Uh, this common sense reasoning that I'm talking about here is kind of one of the main bottlenecks in terms of really building uh, really rich computational systems, artificial intelligence systems. Um, flip that around, instead of story understanding, making up new stories, stories that have never happened in the real world, that have never been told before. Um, such as this story here about um, a guy and a girl who go on a date for the first time. This is actually output from one of my computer systems. Um, we'll jump to the chase. John gets a kiss at the end of the night, so happy ending. Okay, so aside from just saying, can we tell stories, what would, do we actually want to do with these things? Well, in computer games and entertainment, we might want to have an um, unlimited number of um, story plot lines for our games. If you think about training and education in virtual worlds, training scenarios are stories, case studies, uh, work problems are, are stories as well of some sort. And then also virtual rapport, rapport with virtual humans. So the fact is that we can put people at ease when they have to deal with unpleasant circumstances, say with a health coach or something like that, when they can gossip and tell stories and be humorous and that sort of thing. Affective response to stories. So people have affective responses to stories. So here's a very, very short story, often attributed to uh, Hemingway. This is, in fact, a true story. So my wife and I, when my son was born, uh, that night in the, ho in, the, in the hospital when our son was born, so that's kind of tough to talk about, but um, that night he was born was when he first learned that my son had really big feet. Okay, it's enormous. Like, I mean, if he was running for president, they'd be talking about those things in the, uh, in the, in the primary. So, but of course, all, the, all those, you know, our family got us all these little cute outfits and shoes, and, you know, it's clear he's never going to be able to wear those shoes. So we had to get rid of them. So, um, anyways, happy Mother Day. Uh, so, obviously, understanding when people are going to feel drama, understanding how to build suspense into stories for entertainment is good, but also think about automated journalism. You tell a, a particular um, journalistic report, how are we going to kind of bring out those kind of emotions or these feelings, or how will people actually respond? Will this actually make people upset? Well, the sorts of things that we might want to build into our computer systems. Uh, explanation. Human-robot interaction. Why did that robot just do that extraordinarily crazy thing? What the hell were you thinking, right? How can the computer actually tell us um, the circumstances, what it was doing, and maybe why it chose to do that versus some other things. Um, one of the most interesting things about explanation is their stories, but the thing that really kind of clued me into uh, explanation stories is something called rationalization. So I don't know how many of you watched the, uh, the AlphaGo games. 
uh, where the computer beat the, the best Go player in the world. Um, that was really boring. But these two guys there were explaining what was going on, and they weren't explaining what the AI was doing. Most of the answers to what is the AI doing was, I multiplied 10,000 numbers together because I'm a neural net, and came up with this answer. But that's not what they're saying. They're kind of building a story around how attacks and counterattacks are doing. They're really anthropomorphizing this. Of course, that's not what the algorithm was thinking at all, right? But it made us understand and be more comfortable and more familiar with what was actually going on, even though nothing that was being said by the commentators was actually going on underneath the hood. And then finally, machine enculturation. We're going to have autonomous agents, we're going to have autonomous robots driving cars out in the world with us uh, very, very soon. Um, and they're going to rub elbows with us, they're going to get in our ways, and we need to be able to, to help them kind of integrate into our society. Matter of fact, we're already there. I bet most of you have an AI in your pocket right about now. And even recently we saw about how those things can go horribly, horribly wrong and say really inappropriate sorts of things because they don't understand what they're saying and they don't understand the implications and the cultural norms and whether they're violating cultural norms. Now it turns out Tay was attacked, it was forced to say things he wanted to know. But, it, but there's a kind of a lesson about what could go wrong. It was very illustrative. So how do we basically tell computers what our culture is like and how they should behave in our culture? Last I checked, when my son was born, who's now a healthy two and a half year old, it didn't come with the user manual. Um, but we do know that we can, they can learn, children can learn, so computers should be able to learn too. One way we can bootstrap this is by using fictional literature. So it turns out when people write stories, they encode implicitly their values, norms, and conventions into the stories uh, they wrote. Everything from our allegorical tales, our fables, to even you know, our sci-fi stories, right? So any scene that happens in a restaurant tells us what happens in a restaurant. What happens when aliens do attack the Earth? Which values do you give up? Which ones do you hold on to? Uh, those sorts of things. So, quickly, a couple of projects that I've been doing in building computational narrative uh, intelligences. I'm going to talk about story generation, and I'm going to talk about building um, agents that can learn our cultures from stories. So, story generation, uh, one of the big problems with story generation is that narrative intelligence is knowledge intensive. Go back to my examples of restaurants and going on dates. Right? We want to build a system that can tell a story about what it's like to go on a date. It has to get those details right. It has to give us something plausible. It can't just throw random things out there. And therefore, it needs to know what we all know, that common sense knowledge that we have, uh, to build on that and do interesting things like that. Now, previously, we built these micro worlds. We built these nice models of going on dates. But that really limited our systems. They couldn't actually do much more than tell us the stories that we asked for in the first place. So my work has been in doing what I call open story generation, which is can we build a system that can tell a story about virtually any topic? And what we need to do is we need to get around the knowledge engineering bottleneck, right? It needs to learn everything that we do out in the real world and all the stories that we like to tell. And this turns story generation into a machine learning problem. It turns out that the hard part about story generation was not making the stories. It was learning well, where do we get the knowledge that we need to actually tell the stories. So, I've been approaching this and I've been building a system called Scheherazade, which really kind of treats this as a just-in-time domain modeling problem. So the idea here is if a user comes along and says, I want a particular story about something, let's say um, a bank robbery, tell me a story about a bank robbery, the system can go in and say, do I know anything about bank robberies? If I do, I can make stories all day long. If not, I'm going to go out and I'm gonna find the place to get the information. In this particular case, well, the knowledge is in people's heads already. So let's go and crowdsource the knowledge we need, bring that back into our memory system, and then we can start to tell stories from that particular thing. So it's gonna crowdsource basically a corpus of narrative examples, learn a generalized model, and then basically remix that model in lots of different ways to tell lots of different stories, and then do this over and over again to build up its memory um, of all the different things that people like to tell stories about. Okay, so what it actually does, what does the model look like? It was something we call a plot model, uh, plot graph, basically it's going to look like this. So this is a uh, plot graph of uh, going to a fast food restaurant. This is not a flow chart, this is not a finite state machine, this is basically more like a partial order plan where these are the main events and the arrows represent uh, temporal orderings. So this says things like uh, you must pl place your order before you pay for food, that sorts of things. We learn that model basically by going out in the crowd and asking dozens or hundreds of people to tell very simple stories about what's happened to them when they've gone to do these exact same sorts of situations. Then we use a uh, repertoire of different machine learning techniques such as semantic clustering to identify the things that happen most often in these stories, the ordering that happens most often between these events, and you do this over time and what happens is you build up a graph like that. I won't go into the 
details that's been published in various other places. Uh, but to kind of give you an idea of what we're able to do, let's give uh, you know, some examples of the models we've been able to learn. This is the fast food restaurant example here. The thing I'm not showing you is that it also learns that some things never co-occur with each other. So for example, driving through, going through the drive-thru. You go through the drive-thru and you never walk into the restaurant. It's learning these sorts of things. And you can kind of see how you kind of have a, um, a walk-in script and a drive-thru script. Um, it's a little bit more complicated than that. It's a little bit hard to show. It's multidimensional. But if you can look at this, you kind of get the general idea that it's learning more or less what happens when we go to fast food restaurants. Uh, that's particularly nice. This is my favorite data set. This is the uh, data set we actually asked hundreds of people what happens when they go on dates to movie theaters. This is the model we learned, and this is my favorite part. <laughs> so I'm not saying we beat the Turing test. We absolutely did not. But I will say that there are lots of 13-year-old boys who are envious of my area. <laughs> um, and we also did bank robberies because, hey, it's getting harder and harder to buy funding, get funding, so we're going to have to <laughs> somehow, if anyone has a robot that they can lend me, please let me know. Uh, nothing will go wrong. Okay. Um, now it turns out, like I said, once you build these models, once you do the machine learning to learn these models, these domain models, and if they get them right, story generation itself is actually a fairly trivial process. I'm gonna, it's so trivial, I'm not even going to explain how it happens, but here again is a story that was actually uh, generated from uh, the movie date uh, corpus and data model that we actually uh, crowdsourced. Okay, so turning to another thing, another area, um, can we use stories to teach our agents and our robots uh, what it's like to live in our culture and how not to break the norms or violate the values that we have uh, in our societies and our cultures? So really the question here is, well, how do we get an agent or a robot? How do they know it's appropriate behavior? And the way we're treating this is, again, as a machine learning problem, uh, slightly more complicated. But what we're going to do is, again, start with a narrative corpus, a corpus of narrative examples of what proper behavior is, correct behavior is, given as narrative examples, uh, turned into a plot graph, which is a way of basically getting rid of noise, cleaning up the data, and building a uh, kind of mere, more pure mo uh, model, gets rid of outliers and stuff like that. And then converting that plot graph into a reward function that can then control a reinforcement learning agent or computer robot. So basically, to boil it down, we're going to teach our agents and robots to emulate this, the protagonists in our stories. And like with the previous work, this, these are very simple instructional stories, very liberal. You know, when you go to the restaurant, you do this, then I do this, then I do this, uh, those sorts of things. And what, what we're really saying here is that these plot graphs, and thus for the reward functions, are really about social conventions. What order do you do things? What do you do? What sorts of things do you do when you go into these sociocultural situations? And to kind of illustrate this and give you an idea of what I'm talking about, um, here's a very kind of a simple um, case study that we've been running. Uh, we call this the pharmacy world problem. It's a classic reinforcement learning grid world sort of problem. But the problem here is we have an agent who's at home, a robot, perhaps someday. We need to send it out to go get a prescription drug and return it to its owner. So imagine this is a healthcare robot, you have someone who's aging at home who's not able to go out and do it itself. Now it turns out, even in this sort of simple environment, the reward function that you tell it, what you tell it to do is very important, the goal. If you tell it, bring back the uh, prescription drug to me as quick as possible, any idea what it does? It goes straight to the pharmacy, walks behind the counter, grabs the drugs, makes a run for it. Okay? We would call this stealing. Um, <laughs> now, if we use the um, technique that I've been talking about here, when we start with stories, and I give it a whole bunch of stories about what happens when normal people go to uh, pharmacies, those stories tend to have things like, well, we, I wait in line until it's my turn. I hand the, uh, the, uh, the person behind the counter my money. Then I take the, the medicine. And when it learns that those things are actually an important part of the strategy of doing these things, then it tends to prefer actually doing those things. It starts to emulate the other uh, protagonists in the stories. It starts to learn that the most effective way of doing it, the most rewarding way, is to actually follow the social convention. And this is without ever kind of selling, telling it the rules of the game, the rules of the world. I should also note that um, there's no steal action in this domain. Right? You can do things like you can give money, you can pick up things. Right? To us, stealing is when you pick up something without exchanging money. Right? So now it's learned that giving money is an important thing that you do before you take it. Um, okay, and so basically, if we tell our system, Coyote, the stories that encode our cultural um, assumptions, our social conventions, 
then it will tend to learn that it's desirable to actually follow those sorts of things. Now, this is kind of a lightweight, sort of shallow notion of um, AI morality, but in some sense it is a sort of situation that it's learning to keep itself out of trouble in that sense. So, I'm going to finish up there. Uh, hopefully I've given you some idea that um, why I think this notion of narrative storytelling and narrative intelligence is such an important thing as we go forward into more and more complicated, sophisticated uh, artificial intelligences, machine learning systems, and eventually robots. Uh, story generation and narrative intelligence is this key capability that really applies to lots of different situations. You can think about how all those example challenges are going to play a role in lots of different domains. And ultimately what we're really doing is we're saying we're going to use this notion of storytelling and narrative to say, well, what we're doing is we're saying we're making computers understand us better because we tend to think in stories, we tend to communicate in stories. It is the more, more natural often way for us to express ourselves or to uh, understand our own situation and our own state. So maybe computers need to understand that too. And then also the flip side of affecting these agents' robots' behaviors so that they, you know, they don't work the same way we do. But maybe we can make them seem less alien, less foreign, and more interpretable, understandable to them by emulating the things that we just are wired to read, to see, and understand to begin with. So I'm going to leave you there. Um, I look forward to um, having more of a discussion about this um, at the, the panel after the next presentation. So thank you very much.